This is an emergency broadcast transmission. This is not a test. This is an emergency broadcast transmission. This is not a test. Please remain calm. Welcome to the How to Survive the Narcissist Apocalypse podcast. I am Chad the Impaler, and thank you for showing up this episode. And on this episode, we have a narcissist abuse survivor interview, and it was with a a woman named Jana. And Jana was telling her story for the very first time. And if you have been in this position before, telling your story for the very first time is not an easy thing to do. And to add double the pressure, telling your story for the very first time on a podcast is even harder to do. And there's a lot of pressure behind it, uh, especially with, you know, me on the other side. Uh, Jana fought through uh, her uneasiness at the beginning. She did a very good job of, of telling her story. Um, and uh, Jana had, uh, was married to a a narcissist for quite a long period of time. And we unpack a lot of things in this episode. I didn't know how this episode was uh, going. And uh, there's a lot of trauma, I guess, involved in in this episode. I didn't know if I was triggering her. And I was, I was uh, towards the end, you can tell I I was, I was uh, pretty concerned uh, for Jana's uh, well-being on the other side. But uh, the good news is after we got off, off the phone, uh, or off this podcast, we spoke for a long time. And, uh, at the end of our conversation, uh, at a good, we had a good sense or I had a good sense that, uh, Jana was in uh, a good place. So I just really want to thank uh, Jana for being involved, uh, with her podcast once again, because it, it was a, you know, a very, uh, tough thing to do to tell your story for the first time, and you, she should be very proud of herself because she was she's a brave a brave person. So now, uh, without further ado, I am going to just play the interview, and I will uh, do a follow up at the end and uh, give my thoughts about everything that happened, and uh, you know, poison your ears with my voice. Uh, one last time before I go. So thank you. And here is Jenna. So thank you everyone for tuning in f- this episode. I have here with me Jana. How are you, Jana? I'm good. How are you, Chad? I am doing pretty good. I'm having a, I'm having a great day, actually. And uh, it's, it's rare, but I'm having a great day. So uh, you are a narcissist abuse survivor. You were in yes, a 10-year marriage. Um, actually, it was uh, 12. We 12. separated after 10 years, but it, just, it was just finalized finally on the 31st of May. And it was, it was uh, 12 years, uh, 2 months, and 22 days. Our, uh, so. <laughs> you know, to how many minutes and hours, how many hours and minutes and seconds do you know? I, I didn't go that far. All right. So I didn't go that far. everyone listening, as always, I am now turning the floor over to you. Tell us your story. Um, our story started really fast and looking back, you know, it, you know, anytime you make a decision, just spontaneously, you know, it's just never a good one, but, um, I was, uh, separated from my first husband and my cousin, her husband worked with this man and she was, you know, talking him up saying, you know, this, you've got to meet this guy. Like he's, you know, he's so nice. He's so charming. Um, you know, I know like you're not divorced yet, but you know, let me introduce you guys. Like, I think you'll hit it off. And that's exactly how it started. And, um, just from the first time we met each other, he, you know, he was just all in and it was, um, like I went to my cousin's house to hang out and I just remember him telling her like, don't, whatever you do, like, don't let her leave. Like he wanted like more time with me. And that's, you know, that's just where it hit off. And, um, okay. He, uh, my first red flag. Okay. He moved in with me, like without my consent, like he moved in with me very quickly. Um, 
you know, he just would bring, you know, stay over for the weekend and bring a bag, you know, the next weekend, bring another bag. And I remember feeling really uncomfortable, like, why is he not leaving? But then at the same time, quality time is my love language. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh gosh, like he wants, you know, he wants to spend so much time with me. Like, this is awesome. And, you know, thinking back, it was never about, it was never about time. It was about free rent. And so he was there and, you know, I had two daughters from my first marriage and, you know, he was, you know, he was everything, but he wasn't everything that my first husband was. I shouldn't say that, but just, there were a lot of differences in the two and I appreciated that. And, uh, you know, maybe I felt flattered by all the, you know, him just being there all the time. And I felt like he was there for me, but then meanwhile, he was really, you know, staying at my house for free. I so, caught him. So where was he, um, where was he living before this? With his mom. Okay. He was with his mom. Okay. How, <laughs> how old was he oh, at this point? He was 27 years old. Okay. So he was in and out of the military, um, active duty, the national guard, but no, he, he lived with his mom and he had, he had a first marriage that was about a year long and they divorced. And it wasn't a very, it wasn't a good situation, but, um, but the talk of marriage started with us. Like he started talking about marriage almost immediately. And I, you know, I was on board with that for some reason. And, you know, he was talking mostly about, uh, BAH pay with the military with, you know, him getting like a higher pay because he was about to go to a school in Sacramento, California. And, you know, he was going to get more pay if we were married. So, um, um, sorry, I'm blanking. That's okay. I, I, so <laughs> I, 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 have, about- I have a question. Uh, at this point, uh, he's, is, is he moving out of his house? Does, do you know yet if he has a good relationship with his mom or if she's on his case about everything and he just needs to get away? His relationship with his mom is very, um, it's very too involved. And she was, she was not happy that he moved in. She like, she was just like not happy at all. And, um, oh my God. Okay. Tell me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for ruining your podcast. Why? <laughs> no, like, don't. Do you edit this? Um, like, I, like, for some reason, no, like, I have not thought about the beginning of our relationship, and I don't even know how long. And another thing is, like, I have PTSD, mm-hmm. like, really bad, and, like, talking about this, like, it's causing makes me a problem. Flare up. Okay. No. So- no, I'm so sorry. Like, oh no, we can. can we, oh no, we we can. Uh, if you want to stop, we can stop. No, I just I I feel like I need to get past. For some reason, I just cannot get past the beginning. No, I like made notes and stuff. Like, I'm super like. Oh, okay. But now, no, but now I'm just like, oh my god, like why can't I, like, roll past that in my brain. So where, where are you stuck? <sighs> what, what's, where, what has you stuck? What part? Um, almost just like after we moved in. So after just like the, the marriage, like the marriage part. And that's probably, that's probably why I'm blanking because like he was deployed, he was deployed for a year mm-hmm. after that. Like he went to Sacramento, California, and then he went to Iraq. Oh, he did. Okay. How long was he gone for? Um, um, he was he was in Iraq for a year, and I found out that I was pregnant with our son when he had been deployed for um, like he was gone about two months, and I found out I was pregnant with our son, and you know I just like kept the house going at home, and meanwhile trying to. Um, navigate the relationship with his mom, you know, that just, that just was, um, well, it's like, I mean, it's difficult. You're, he's gone away. 
and now you have a third child. Is your previous husband helping you with your other two children? He was, but it was it was a mess because he we got married very young, and he wanted to party and he wanted to hang out. So he just wasn't being the dad that he should have. So I was meanwhile trying to have my own relationship with my new husband, and I was pregnant. And then, um, you know, him, me having to just kind of say like, "What's going on?" and You know, we had a lot of conflict. There was a lot of conflict with ex-husband. There was a lot of conflict with my mother-in-law. And she was just, she was just all up in our business and just wouldn't, she didn't have good boundaries. And, you know, like I made my husband a blanket. Um, You know, I just, all of these gifts for my husband had to be very out there because normal stuff that you get people, it was never enough. It was never like he always found something to say. So I went, I went to the arts and crafts store and I got like military themed fabric and I ended up hand stitching like a message on the inside of this blanket. It was really out there. It was really stupid, but we were in the car, me and my mother-in-law and we were going to the post office and I said, you know, I made this blanket for him and um, I put a message on the inside. She bolted. Oh, just, flew over the seat to go in the back seat like she that just really made her mad you know it was just everything was a competition with her and so we had a hard time when he was in Iraq because the mother-in-law was just saying it was everything was a competition and um she she would tell me that he was sharing confidential information only with her, like uh, kind of military things that they couldn't share, but she was saying that they would share. So she just wouldn't, you know, let the relationship be what it should have been, and she was always there, so that was a big thing. But um, he ends up coming back from overseas, and, you know, he milked that big time, you know, with everybody that he met. and, And he didn't, you know, he didn't work. He was didn't have a job, didn't try to get a job. So all of the money from overseas, you know, just all of that, just money problems started. And, um, you know, just things got really bad, you know, they, you know, fast forward, you know, 10 years is a long time to live together and be together. And, um, it was, it was just really hard. Like he started treating my daughters differently. He, the punishments were so cruel and so harsh. The punishments didn't fit the crime. So, and so when, you know, it, when he came, when he, when he left, was his uh, personality still uh, the love bombing version of himself? And when he came back, uh, it was the different version of himself or did that already change before he left? I feel like the love bombing changed as soon as we got married. I, I, there was definitely a shift, um, after we got married and after I got pregnant, um, the, his unit was allowed to come home for the holidays for a two week period. And, you know, I, I just had to do everything over the top. I had to just always just be like, Oh gosh, let me do this for you. And, um, at 13, I, I was 13 weeks pregnant and I went and paid for, a, uh, like a 3d ultrasound and that's not, e- that's too early for a 3d ultrasound, but you know, my husband's only home during this two week period. And, you know, I want to do this for him so he can see his baby, you know, it's his first child, you know, he gets to see his baby. And so we go and pay for this ultrasound. And this was also a weird moment that I think back to and, I just think like what was going on. Okay. You know, a pregnancy moment, like between a husband and a wife, it's like a together thing. Well, the image of our unborn son went on the wall, like in a projector form and he gets up and leaves and he goes and touches the wall in this way that almost like looks like some just like movie. And like, so he completely separates himself from me and, you know, goes over there and just was almost like 
it was never like a together thing. It was him. And I remember thinking, like, why do I feel so alone in this moment? And, like, I did this for him. And, you know, he left my side and, you know, was over there crying, like, at the wall. It was very, it was very uncomfortable. And it was very awkward. And So he was, um, he was at the wall where the, the picture was on the wall and he was crying at the wall by himself? Yes. Okay. And he was touching the wall. He was touching the image of our baby in the image. And, you know, I'm just on the table all greased up, like, okay, (laughs) like what's going on. But now it's, um, just, we ended up, we had a very rough relationship with his mom, but, um, right after he moved in with me, a lot of junk mail started coming in the mail and it was like hard, hardcore pornography, mailings in the my name in his name and then about five variations of spellings of his name and my name so every day we were just getting like porn in the mail and three four years later you know she's still bringing mail to our house and saying this is his mail it came in the mail you know throw it away you know whatever Well, this one specific day she came over when he was at work and she said, and she had one of those porn things. And she said, oh, you know, look how they spelled his name. Isn't this funny? And then she laughed and she handed it to me and she goes, okay, you can go throw this away now. And we had been through a lot with his mom, but that was the final straw with her. Um, You know, so I ended up just saying, you know, she can't come around, you know, she just causes fights with us. And, you know, I was, made out to be this person that I'm not in a relationship with my mother-in-law when I felt like she was just trying to have conflict and cause fights. She she just came over right there. There was nothing good that was going to happen of her showing up with a porn male. What it like, uh, you know, she was coming to start uh, to stir you up. No, it was a trap. You know, that's not even front page news, you know, Oh, look how they spelled his name. Isn't this funny? And I'm thinking, no, I've been seeing these for years and I've had it. And, you know, he wouldn't listen to me. I would say, you know, your mom's doing this, your mom's doing this. You know, she actually pushed my daughter, you know, she was trying to play with her grandson and she treated my daughter terribly. And my daughter wanted to play and she was only like six or seven and she actually pushed my daughter and it was really uncomfortable. And I've never, that's one thing that this experience has given me. I've gotten more courage and more backbone to stand up you know it's amazing to have things happening in front of you that's not okay and you can't even you feel like you can't even say anything well why am I going to say anything because this person flips everything to make make it seem like it didn't just happen or I'm just being dramatic or I shouldn't even been saying anything in the first place but no, there was just a day where, you know, he he snapped and, you know, threw our Christmas tree. Like, the littlest things would set him off. You know, he drank. He had a horrible um, Captain Morgan addiction mm-hmm. that just, it controlled our lives. Couldn't go anywhere, you know. It did, just, it was really sad. Did he have that addiction before he went away or uh, did it just... He in, did. In, okay. Yeah, he had that addiction from the beginning. And, I, you know, I didn't drink. I had my daughters really young and, you know, I was just really focused on, you know, being with my kids. And I didn't have friends. I didn't have a lot of friends that drank. And so when most people are 20 and 21 and out partying, you know, I was taking care of my kids, you know, and I, I enjoyed that. Like, I don't have regrets, but... That's one thing. Like, I didn't, alcohol wasn't a big part of my life until he was a part of my life. And I'm responsible for my own actions, but he was continuously purchasing me stuff and wouldn't, he would not want my glass to be empty. And looking back, I think, you know, that could have been that he didn't want to drink alone. It could have been, why am I going to confront him about his drinking if he can just point the finger at me and say, well, you have a problem too. Look at you. Good thinking. And, 
you know, that was frustrating. I remember having a glass of wine and feeling pretty buzzed, like, and like hey, I'm good. And then here he comes with a bottle and just fills it all. Okay, a normal serving of wine, I mean, he filled, he would pour it, like, to the top. And I'm like, you don't, like, like just stop, you know, like, why, like, why do you want me to drink all of this? Like, I don't understand. And that was, he, ne- he never stopped drinking. That was a, so frustrating and I couldn't say anything about it. And he was just, he would just snap at the silliest things, holes in the walls, nor things that are justifiable anger wouldn't even bother him. But then things that just didn't even make sense for him to blow up. Um, we had two dogs and this one dog that we rescued, she was, she hated him and she was terrified of him and she would hide behind the couch whenever he would yell. And so he he had a, he he, he had a quick temper. He did. And it was terrible. And when he would, when he would lash out and, and physically it was, it was unlike anything I've ever seen before. Because it looks like a child having a tantrum, like stomping, just stomping and throwing and hitting. And it looks like a a child, but it's an adult. And, you know, something that he did that, you know, I I feel like I can say I'll never forgive him for this, but I'm, I'm kind of there. He bought me a laptop for Mother's Day and... I had it for about three years and it had all of my pictures on it. And then, you know, there was a night that he cussed out one of my daughters when I left and I came back to a mess and this was a usual happening. And so to start the, what's going on? Like who, like how, how do I solve this? Like, what, you know, how do I fix it? And my daughter's saying, you know, he did this. So I go confront him. Okay. She says he did this, you know, what's going on? And he, he loses it. You know, you do not question what he does mm-hmm. at all, or he will snap. And he grabs my laptop, and, like, he didn't smash it once. Like, he proceeds to try to break this laptop over his knee, and it's not working because it's not possible. So he splits the thing open and splits it in two, and then just goes with each smaller piece. And he's just bashing it, like, a monster and I grab for it. I'm, you know, trying to save it. You know, I'm worried about my pictures. I'm just like screaming, like, stop. Meanwhile, the kids are watching and I'm just like, stop. And while I'm trying to grab the laptop, I scratch his arm. I mean, he's just flailing, trying to keep the laptop from me. His neck gets scratched in his arms. When he goes to work the next day, he flips the whole situation into I attacked him mm-hmm. and his coworkers were so concerned about him and they wanted him to call the police and press charges on me. And I think back and I think, you know, this, I think if he would have known that I was going to leave him, I think he would have done it in a heartbeat. But I, I truly think he thought I was stuck. He thought I was stuck there. He thought I would never leave. And we, cause we, towards the end, we were just kind of in this, in this place of roommates. He was sleeping in another room. We were completely separate. It was the loneliest thing you've ever imagined. And it was reality. You know, my life was my dogs and my kids. And I just remember thinking, you know, I'm so grateful I get to stay at home with them. Like I homeschooled for two years and, you know, we rescued the dog. It was just, it was a happy place. But at the same time, the only, the only thing keeping us from being truly happy was him. And we just had to, we were just all on eggshells and the kids never wanted to be home with him alone. Mm-hmm. It was terrible. And you know, that one female dog that we rescued, she would hide from him and it would make him so mad. He would, he would imagine a grown man just being like, why are you hiding from me? get out here, you know, and he just would go for her. And it was sad because she was trying to get away from him. It was just a circus. And, you know, he ended up grabbing her one night and just 
she was a large, she was probably 60 pounds, and, you know, he picked her up by her fur and her skin and oh. throws her across our living room. And the kids are screaming. But that was his goal. His goal was to just upset the kids and upset me. And then absolutely he knew that the, how to get me embarrassed, make a public scene. May, you know, let's go have a scene in front of the neighbors. Let's go peel out in front of the house. Let's go just make this huge scene. And then it, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. And it was always him to freak out in public, but I'm the one that caused it. Like I would get blamed for it. And no. So towards the end, he was going to another church. He quit his government job to, um, start his own company and everything goes downhill from there. Um, you know, we lost our insurance. Um, Oh, his financial decisions were horrific. Um, you know, scammed Fannie Mae, took out loans against his 401k. Um, just the financial decisions were just terrible. And, um, um, yeah, just, you know, and I had the good credit. I had credit. He had none. So, mm -hmm. um, during this, you know, moving forward, oh, sorry, sorry, during, during this time, um, how, how old are your kids during this time? My kids were, um, when I left, oh gosh, I've got to do some math two years ago. For, my oldest was 14 and, um, my middle daughter was 12. Okay. So you were, and, you were raising them and you were raising, uh, a newborn. You're protecting them as much as you can. How are you coping during this whole time? Because you're shielding kids in one way as best you can, dealing with him in the other way. Obviously, you have no time for you. What is going on with you uh, in this period of time? Not much is going on with me. Unfortunately, the wine consumption increased. Mm -hmm. And I, I ended up forming a dependency on that you know, my kids were always number one. My kids never saw me passed out drunk, but no, I was very, I was very withdrawn. I was very depressed. You, you try having friends whenever your husband goes around town to your family, to your church. He, I don't know what he would tell people, but all I know is you could tell things were being said. So I was isolated. I was drinking too much. I was overweight. I was sad. I was alone, you know, thinking I'm so young and I'm stuck in this horrible marriage. And, and then, you know, my first husband is, you know, catching wind of all of this and coming at me. And then my husband is causing fights with my first husband. He would just, I would compare it to a can of gasoline. Like that's all he was. He would just ignite this huge fire and then would leave. Mm -hmm. He would leave me to handle my first husband. And like the police got called one night because, you know, he blocked FaceTime on the computer. Like he would just prevent them from talking to their dad. It was really, it was so sad. And he wouldn't let them communicate. And it really upset my first husband. And, you know, he, he came over upset, you know, confronting him. And then, he was inside the house terrified. He wouldn't go outside. And it's like, you know, you started this huge fight. You started this huge fight. And then like, you're leaving me in the front lines and I'm alone. And, you know, just navigating through all of that. It was, it was, impo it was almost impossible. Did you, then, did you have anyone who was empathetic to your, uh, to what was going on that you were able to confide in? Uh, anyone, confided, anyone at church? Uh, no, 
No, any any situation that he was involved in, I kind of felt like I couldn't say anything at church, but I have an ex-aunt that I was very close to. She's only four years older than me. And, you know, I would tell, I would tell her everything. Just like, Hey, well, you know, we're struggling. And, you know, maybe because she was separate from the family and she's very easy to talk to and very understanding. She, she you know, she was very concerned because she could see stuff. And then I had a friend that, um, you know, we're not close, close, but, you know, we still, we still talk and she's actually going through a divorce right now, but I would tell her everything and we would just be texting from the bathtub. Like, Oh my God, like we're so miserable. Like, what are we going to do? You know? And what we felt so trapped because of money, we're both stay at home moms. And, you know, ironically, both of our husbands worked at the same place, like the same government job. It, you know, they didn't work together, but at the same place, but we were just kind of in the same place, and so I was able to connect with her. And, um, but you know, the decision to finally move out—it was just—it was terrifying because I didn't have a job. Like I was so desperate to move out, I didn't have a job. Now I sold things online for about ten years, kind of part time, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to keep doing that, and then. I just kind of put the word out like I need a job and no, he funded me moving out completely because I let him know. I said, you know, you let me down. You have done so many things to destroy our relationship. You're responsible for this and you alone. So you're going to be responsible for me moving out on my own. And, you know, a lot of people aren't popular of this opinion, you know, all the kind of naysayers that, that took his side and, Um, you know, he paid my first month's rent. He got me a storage unit. He helped me move. You know, how incredibly awkward is that to leave your husband? And he is the one helping you in the U-Haul. It was awful. But at least he wasn't putting up a stink, though, in in another way of not letting you leave. Or or did he try and hoover you back at some point? Oh, Oh, no way. By the time he dra- he drained me financially, so by the time he was done doing that, he he was done. There's nothing he wanted from uh, me. He was in. He slept in our son's bedroom. Like we had a sexless marriage. It was he voluntarily slept on a love seat in my son's room for nine months. I mean, and then a couple of years before that, there was a six month period where he had moved out into the other bedroom. Listen, I was so upfront with every, like, I would always put it out there like, yo, we're struggling. I don't even have a wedding ring. Oh, yeah. He, he disliked me so much. I never had a wedding ring in a decade. <laughs> like, he didn't even think enough of me to buy me one. So I remember on our seventh anniversary, I bought me a ring off of a website that was fake. And I lied to everybody. I mean, I felt... It made me feel like a terrible person. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm stuck with this man. I'm in this horrible relationship, and I don't even deserve a symbol of a marriage, what everybody else has. And I ended up buying me a cubic zirconia, and I wore it everywhere, and it was probably two carats. Everyone probably knew I was lying, but I was like, look what he got me for. Did it look good? I'm sorry. Did it look good? (laughs) Yes. That's all that matters. I mean, I liked it, but... You know, looking down like it was sad, you know, and, and oh, I got to a point where I threw that, I threw that ring away and I, I didn't wear a ring the last two years that he stayed at home. I, you know, I can't remember the exact moment I took it off, but there was a moment that I was like, this is over. I've got to start preparing to move out and I'm just not going to, I'm not even wearing a ring anymore because it doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. And so he moves me out. Well, we move out together, like both of us. And the first thing he does when um, he's we're done moving is he walks into my new bedroom and just collapses on my bed. And, like, with his arms, like, behind his head. And I was like, what is he doing? It's like, get up. Like, don't infect my space. You know, I'm leaving you for a reason. Like, I don't, you know... Like, we're not friends. Like, get out of here. But 
like moving out, I ended up finding a job, like everything, everything just started falling apart when I moved out. And that's one thing that I wasn't expecting. I was expecting we're out of the abuse. Like I took my kids away from this and I was expecting everything to fall together. And instead of falling together, it really fell apart. Everything was neglected in our marriage. And when I say everything, I mean everything, our cars, our house, our, um, our car needed brakes so bad. So the car that I took, the brakes fully went out two days. Like it was days. It was less than a week after I moved out. Like I need all new brakes for my vehicle. And it was humiliating because I had, I had to give him a call and I, because you know, this is another thing that you've been responsible for that is, you know, broke down and like, I don't have the means to take care of it. And that's something that he used against me later, you know, you know, Oh, you know, I'm so good to her, you know, but yeah, the brakes went out. You know, I, I had a tooth that needed a root canal that we couldn't afford because he had quit his government job and started working for, um, he was self-employed, but he worked for a church also. How ironic. And then, so he was left in the house because there was a lot of repairs that needed to get done. And he ended up losing our house and this church. He was given a trailer to live in for free. Um, it was a joke. He was given a car. Uh, he ends up dropping off our dogs in my rent house when I couldn't have animals. And that was devastating because look at, he wanted me to be the one that failed in the kid's eyes. He wanted me to be the one to give, to have to give them away. Kind of thinking back to why would he have done that? Well, you know, because I was going to lose my security deposit and then, um, you know, my grandma ended up passing away and then just like the financial stuff really started piling up. I, all of our debt was in my name, you know, so I'm just like maintaining all of these payments. And then, um, we find an attorney and we were supposed to agree on everything. And we had a list of everything that we were going to agree on. And then no, like as soon as he saw like, you know, the child support and like he refused to sign it. And then just everything just moved so slow. Just there was just too many changes. You know, I got a um, collections agency notice for our alarm company. Mm-hmm. And that was in my name. And that was the one thing that I failed to call and get my name off of. But I didn't do that because the contract ran out. Well, somehow he got on the phone and extended it. And he, you know, he wasn't even living there. He just extended that for so that would fall back on me and he didn't, you know, he didn't make the minimum payment. So all of that fell on me. Mm-hmm. And then, um, he ends up retaining his own lawyer, suing me for full custody. And then, which then I have to hire a whole new attorney and somehow come up with attorney fees. And so where, am, where is he know, getting the money from? You know, and that's a great question. His, his little job that, you know, you're self-employed and you're going through a divorce, you know, he has the power to accept payments from everybody and, and whatever means that, you know, this, this app, this app. And like he did like church motion graphics, like the core of his self-employment was him doing media work for churches. And, but around the time that, No, he got so much stuff like from these, from the people at his church, like they were giving him so much stuff that he ends up somehow getting on staff. And I do not believe this to this day. And I actually ended up calling the pastor of this church because I was so, I was so outraged by this. It was so wrong. He, on paper, he said that he only made like $19,000 a year at this church and that's it. And it's like, no, I'm not stupid. You're still doing your contract work for all of these other people. And you are just saying that. So your child support is going to be next to nothing. And this church, he had all of this media equipment. He had cameras. He had um, 
digital cameras and video cameras and he started he started doing contract work and it was on it was on his social media and I remember I called the pastor and I'm just like you know you this is wrong like for you to help him lie you know he's using the church's equipment from the church to get money on the side and you know you're aware of all of this and you're covering for him so he he doesn't have to owe a lot in child support and it was really in, yeah, that ended up coming back on me, like in the discovery, he, he wrote that out. But he said that I I called the pastor to get information about him. And that's <laughs> like, that's not even, that's not even why I called. Like, I, I I have enough information on you. Like, I don't care what's going on in his life. I, I don't care. But, you know, I was just thinking the, the principle of it all, like, it's so wrong for him to, to lie and, I'm meanwhile, I'm maintaining all the payments in our debt. And I just feel like I have no relief. And he has these kind people in this church, you know, wife abandoned me. Oh, here's a trailer to live in for free. Wife abandoned me. Here's a car, you know, here's another car, you know, and that was just really frustrating to see that. And, you know, and, and he had moved a hundred miles away, you know, four clothes in our house. That's what he told me. He told me a four clothes in our house. And then I ended up getting a call from around the time that the house was selling, I ended up getting a call from the real estate agent um, saying, you know, he quit paying the house payment. This is devastating. The house isn't going to sell. Um, We need a thousand dollars in closing costs because there's nothing. And she was calling me for money. And I said, I moved out of the house. He had one job. Like, he had one job to do, and that was to sell the house, and, you know, he messes that up, too. And, like, just two months ago, two months ago, I found out that he did, he refinanced the house behind the real estate agent's back, and he got all the equity out of the house behind everybody's back, and at closing, he looked like, he looked like an absolute idiot. Because the tax commission is taxing, like, there's a lien on this property. Like, he owes so much in taxes. He, like, it's... Well, well, well who, whoever was the closing lawyer on the other side of the house who didn't... Were they the one that caught it? Or did they not catch it in the, when, the, when the house went uh, for closing? For the, from the, from the other sure buyer? I'm not sure who... I'm not sure who caught it, but when she called me that day, she was devastated. She was almost near tears, and she she ended up paying the closing costs out of her own pocket. She is the one. She I'm not sure how much she paid out of her commission, but she felt so badly for these people that had been duped, the people buying the home, because that's who really, you know, this affected. Because the house wasn't going to sell unless she gave up her commission for all of the fees because he had taken everything out of it. And I still don't understand how that went down and how, but the people at the tax commission, um, I guess that they, they didn't find that out until they maybe ran the specs on everything to prep for closing. And it, you know, it was, it was just a sad situation, you know, and she, she was pissed. She said, this has never happened to me ever in my entire real estate career. Nobody's ever done this before. And it's like, well, you know, leave it, leave it to him. But, um, yeah. So finding out that he did and just, I even went back to our text, you know, during that time, I don't delete anything. And I went back to the text and he's just seriously sitting here telling me, Oh, you know, how the house is closing on September, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, yeah, uh, you should get your money soon, and all these just details about money. And I'm thinking these are just lies. Like so, these are lies, and mm-hmm. you know it's just amazing. Um, and it's it's amazing how I gave him too much credit. Also, you know, because moving forward, you know, there's nothing. You know, there's nothing he tells me that. Um, but I believe, but so, so we, when, you know, now that. Sorry, when now that like uh, the house is sold, 
you're divorced or you're, or you're in the process of finishing divorce, when do you unpack everything and realize, uh, discover that you're dealing with a narcissist or someone with uh, a, a mental disorder that uh, has an offshoot of narcissism? Um, when does that happen? And how, how, what, I, hap- what happened in your brain when you figured that out? I left him January 9th of 2017. Mm-hmm. I just found, like, things just started falling into place. It was f- about four months ago. So it so took you, it took you a year and a half, uh, pretty yes. much. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and what was the moment where you were like, you saw, you read something somewhere? And, uh, it, yes. So w- w- tell me about that. I was on a job and, you know, it's weird just kind of being in the right place at the right time. And this woman that I'm working for, you know, she, I could tell that she was upset. And I said, are you okay? And she said, I'm going to court today. And we started talking and she's going through this horrible divorce. And I said, you know, I'm going through a divorce too. And she looks at me and she says, you know, you need to read this book. And oh, I think it's called Healing from Hidden Abuse. And I <laughs> I read this book and it, it really, like, it was amazing, like, it's insane. I'm literally reading like a textbook, like this happened, this happened, this happened. You have no idea, like being married to someone that long, experiencing what I did, and then finally reading a book with sociopath tendencies, narcissism, and all of these things. And it's so, it's like it's him, you know, and thinking, my gosh, like this is him. Like the reaction, the, his reaction to me, me confronting him, his typical response to that. And, you know, it just a light bulb went off. And honestly, like I've had, I've had so much clarity since I figured all of that out. You have no idea like what a state of con- confusion I was in. I was so like thinking like, is this my fault? Like what happened? Like you're so like the gaslighting, like it's, it's so confusing. If you leave a conversation, just like we didn't solve anything. And now there's so much more confusion and feeling, yeah, feeling blamed. And, you know, he was like, he knew exactly who to manipulate. You know, when I first moved out, I didn't even have the support of my family. You know, my family was on his side because he was so, he was all about me when we were in a crowd and in front of people, the right people. And, you know, that was my family and, you know, I didn't have their support. So, you know, just being on my own and yeah, like I'm just kind of, you know, going off on all of this new knowledge and, you know, figuring, figuring out, okay, but, you know, this is a rampant problem. You know, this affects like so many people, but yet no one really wants to talk about it. You know, it's also really taboo, you know, there's, you know, and also, I can't diagnose it. You know, I can't sit here in court and say, oh, you know, he's this. You know, I can't say that. And, you know, because unfortunately he was never diagnosed. You know, we did go to therapy in our marriage, but, you know, big surprise that my childhood and me, like I was a big topic. You know, he would just turn the tables on me in therapy and he, he would act perfect. And, you know, it would turn on me. So, and, you know, I was told during those sessions, you know, that I had PTSD and, you know, so he's sitting here nodding his head like, dang, you know, see how messed up she is you now, you know, what are we going to do for her? And, you know, just, you know, just kind of realizing all of this, it's, it's, re- it's really helping me out as in predicting, you know, we have this conflict coming up. Well, I know exactly what, I feel like I know exactly what to say to him and I know probably how he's going to reply to me and then you know I'm not feeding into his games anymore and I'm done with that but you know our divorce has just been nothing but a game and you know it fi- like it finally was granted on the 31st mm-hmm. and you know he you know he stole all of our kids savings you know he started that company and he ended up finding one of his ex-pastor friends to 
create a similar company and roll over all of the clients. And so they did a great deal concealing that that is the same business. So he wouldn't have to, you know, share that with me. And, you know, he, he's been a shining star in the legal system, uh, going through the divorce with the exception of he lost his visitation during a four month period. But as soon as he lost it, Like, whatever made him snap, and he had a violent outburst with my son, and my son, you know, vocalized, I don't want to go to my dad's, I'm scared of him, and then we brought that before the court, and they took his visitation away, but, oh, he was a shining star in the supervised weekly visitations, Um, he's, you know, when the the right people are looking, he's, he's on point, he's exactly who he needs to be when the right people are looking and, um, and you know, just, so, so where, where is it now? The divorce is finalized now. Yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of, and you, you, and you have to co-parent. Yeah. Co-parenting is, it's been really difficult because he, he just, you know, wants to act like a victim to our son. And, you know, my son doesn't want to talk to me when he's at his dad's house. So I'm trying, that's something that's coming up often. You know, my son acts completely different when he's with his dad, you know, he'll call me. I'm sorry. He doesn't call me when he's at his dad's. I call him and he sounds different. He doesn't want to talk, but he has to like, my ex-husband calls me every single, like every single night. And, you know, it's just guilt trip. It's, it's, you know, countdown, countdown to my house, you know, and they just get, you know, dad's house is just this fun, fun place. And, but something that happened in court, he actually won um, joint custody. So after the summer, you know, my son's going to be going over there half the time and, Oh, I kind of left out like an important part, um, kind of going back to the, you know, my life. I feel like my life has fallen apart since leaving him. Um, my daughters actually have left uh, one at a time for their dads because, you know, I I don't have my daughters anymore. My, my first daughter moved out of October of 2018. It was about a year, uh, about six months after, I, no, I don't know. Anyways, it was in the fall of 2018, and then my da- my second daughter just left like two weeks ago. So life with mommy has not been fun since the divorce because, I mean, it's been a hardship. You know, I'm, I'm still awaiting my settlement. I'm, you know, I've had to maintain all the payments on our debt because, you know, it's my credit at stake. And then the legal fees and, you know, navigating life with PTSD, it's not, like, it's not fun. You know, and, you know, I think the kids are frustrated with the, you know, the financial end of it because they were used to life one way Mm -hmm. and then they were used to a stay at home mom. And then suddenly I don't get to be that anymore. And after leaving, you know, I didn't have a lot of resources. I didn't even know what to do, you know, and kind of thinking like, you know, what can the purpose of like more knowledge be and more education about this and it's it's like if you can just help somebody going through this if you can give somebody some options like I wish that I could get some kind of checklist together like you need to do this 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 I ended up finding this awesome place it's a division of the YWCA that helped because I had to file a BPO after my son said that he didn't want to go over there and it was just this place and that women can go to for counseling. They can go if they don't have a place to live, like they, it's a resource for housing. It's, you know, you can apply for food stamps. You can get a protective order. You can file a police report. You, they watch your kids. Like it was like this place. And I'm thinking, you know, why didn't I have, you know, when you're isolated, after you go through something like that and you're isolated and you're by yourself and, you feel like you have nobody and you know, even in the church, something like this is frowned upon in a lot of areas, not a lot of churches, 
but some of them and some of them that I have been to, it has, it's not a good place. Like people, people act like you have the plague, you know, if you're going through a bad marriage, a bad relationship, a divorce, you know, some people are like, Oh no, you know, we can't catch what she has because we don't want any of that in our area. So you're kind of just, you know, put to the side and, you know, I really wish there would have been somebody to point me in some directions right whenever I left because that's, that is not easy going from a dependent stay-at-home mom to, okay, I'm going to leave an abusive husband. Like, it, this, it's not fun. Like, it the uh, the people that have gotten a hold of me uh, privately by email that have had uh, situations going on in their life, the first thing I always tell them is if there's a YWCA in the town that you live in, to go to the yeah. YWCA because at least the one thing they can do is point you in the right direction of where to go if they yeah. don't have all of the services uh, that you need. Yeah. And it's it's uh, people forget that it's uh, that it's there, and that's you know it's big. They do, yeah. So, yeah. yeah so, how is your life? Right, you know, you, your daughters aren't with you now. Uh, how is your relationship with them? My relationship, my first daughter that moved out, she's the middle child. She, we. It's taken a long time to get things back because, you know, I, she just wasn't respecting my authority. And so we were kind of betting heads with stuff. But then also, you know, my kids have some deep rooted issues from their stepdad's abuse, mm -hmm. you know, my, but no, we're, we're starting to get on good terms, but. My oldest daughter, she's been battling depression. You know, she's, I had to get her into some intense therapy. She's, I had to like forcefully put her in the car and try to take her to the ER, even though she wouldn't go because she threatened to kill herself again. And she's had a really hard time. And so she, she just moved out and she, you know, she's pretty mad at me, you know, She's acting out for, you know, whatever reasons, you know, teenager, whatever she's been through. And, you know, so she's at dad's and, you know, hope, you know, hopefully things will get better. You know, that's just with each new thing that's happened. That's all I keep hope, hoping for. Like things maybe will get better. Things maybe will get better. And, it, you know, it, I, did, did you listen I, to, uh, we did, I did an episode, uh, a few weeks ago with, or not a few weeks ago, last week, uh, I put it out with Louise and Louise's relationship with her children, uh, with some of them, uh, were good. And then with a couple others, it wasn't, uh, the best. And she knew that there was just a, you know, a lack of trust issue because she was married for 25 years and that uh, wow. uh, there was there was a, a, an erosion of trust over that 25 years of uh, protection. And she uh, did a lot of work and understood that and understood why uh, her kids might be angry. And she knew that. And, and over time, she she knows that uh, part of uh, her life is to, you know, regain uh, that trust and she's doing it by like setting an example of moving forward and uh, being this powerful person that her marriage um, told her she wasn't. And, okay. and, and she thought that if I'm going to show everyone that I'm a different person, I'm going to be this strong person in, in this opposite thing of what everyone told me she wasn't and, and she said slowly but surely for her that's working I don't know if that would work for you but still there's just going to be probably a, 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 a good amount of time it takes to rebuild uh, trust in everyone because I mean everyone was living yeah. in a vol you were living in a volatile situation and you were doing your best uh, your children are in that situation and it was uh, tough to get out of and it was you know it's no one's fault what happened uh 
to everyone, but it, within that, uh, things can be rebuilt. And over time, you'll be able to, to get that stuff rebuilt. You just it, It's time, and it takes uh, care. And you have to be out of it for a while for it to, for it to happen. Yeah. So, so you'll 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 no, get, you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely listen to that episode because I need a dose of hope right now. You know, you know, even if you don't have full custody, just visitation when they're teenagers, like it's hard. And you know, I'm still just not. You know, I'm still not who I feel like I want to be. I feel like I'm still healing from everything. Well, I know I still am. You know, like I had to, like I have to, I still sell stuff online, but I started painting houses. Like I can't, I can't work like in a public in, environment with like a lot of people. Like it's, like I tried it and it was, it was terrible. Like I was having panic attacks. and. So the PTSD was, is really it, affecting your life. It really, it really is. Mm-hmm. It's. I have days where I just shut, I just shut down and I can't breathe. I feel like someone's sitting on my chest and I'm just sitting here like, like, why can't I get over this? Like, I need to, I need to be up and I need to be doing this. Like I've tailored my entire life around this to deal with it. And because I can't, I can't be shoved into a situation that I'm uncomfortable with because like, I just lose it, you know? So I ha- I had probably, two days this week that it just, it shut me down mm-hmm. and it's not cool. You know, it's not cool because I've got kids. I need to be doing this and this, and this, this shouldn't still be robbing me from my life, you know, thinking that, okay, everything's magically going to get better. You know, maybe I was foolish for even thinking that, but just what I kept telling the girls, like, like we got away, you know, why can't, why can't there be some kind of joy that we got away? Like we could still be still in that house with him Mm -hmm. having everything happened still and maybe to a worse degree but we got away and we need to rejoice in that and try to move forward but at the same time the divorce not being final for so long and him getting by with not paying child support and you know, all of this financial abuse that followed. So in a way, like, it's not fair. Like he's almost just done whatever he can to prove that I'm, am this horrible person. And that's why we split up and it's all on me. And, Oh, look, you know, you know, and that was horrible to read in the discovery. Like he used every single thing against me in court, including my own daughter leaving. And, so it is painful, the second one leaving, and I'm just thinking, this is making him so happy. The second that he hears about this, like, and I think in my anger, I actually said it to my daughter. I said, you know, thanks, like, you're, like, you're making him so happy. Like, he's going to write about this. You know, I don't know when, but, you know, he will use this, and it just, it sucks. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think trying to figure out how to conquer the PTSD have you gone you know, to? I am, have you gone to? Or can you afford to see someone who specializes in trauma, like a trauma specialist? This, for, no, at this moment I can't. You know, because I still don't have insurance. For I was never able to get insurance coverage from. You know, after the loss of that, but so no. So I mean, hopefully things will start to improve, and I can. You know, because if I can't help myself, then how? <laughs> How good am I to anybody else? Because mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, I, all of your kids pro- probably need to see uh, a trauma specialist individually. Um, but I, as you know, uh, we're finding out everyone out there is listening. These things uh, cost money, and uh, yeah. that that's the most difficult part. So if anyone uh, is listening to this episode and knows. Um, maybe w- where we can, if there is any b- place uh, free or um, whatever, what's, uh, I, well, uh, am I allowed to say what state you're in? Hello? I'm sorry, what? Am you I allowed to say what state you're in? Hello? Oh, Oklahoma. Okay, if you, Oklahoma, if anyone knows of any resources 
that can be helpful uh, to Jana and you could email me um, through the website um, or, or through my Instagram, that would be wonderful if you could do that. Um, because, you know, you're, once the divorce is final, you, you, you know a lot of what's gone on, you've, you know, in your mind, it sounds like. And uh, you have a lot of trauma and you need, like, the, the next step is to heal that trauma uh, to, mm-hmm. to go forward. Yeah. Because you didn't, you, I mean, you, it's a lot. You, you, how long was it? 12 years? Yeah. I mean, that's 12 years of emotional abuse, of yeah. uh, living in fear, uh, walking on eggshells, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, I'm sure your self-esteem uh, isn't, is it the greatest, you know, you were, uh, a, you were like, let's, you were a 10 going in and this person has stripped you down to being a one or a, or a zero on a chart. And now it's, to, or, 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 or you're down to, let's say, let's say you're even down to three, like the process of the trauma, uh, would probably be to like strip you down all the way back, like to zero, and then to, uh, you know, build you uh, back up and understand what's going on and, and heal everything. Yeah. So uh, how, how are you doing right now? I mean, I'm doing okay. I've actually never told this story in entirety, and I feel like I did, like, leave a lot out. You know, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be two hours long, but... It is, it is painful to hear it again and to, you know, what's done is done. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's done is done and you can't think back and wish for things to be different and think, oh, man, that was such a big red flag. Like, I should have caught that. But I guess the important part is what I keep going back to is just kind of the courage that it took to leave. And it, 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 took a lot of, things, it, it took a lot of courage to leave. It did, Mm. and, you know, it was just crazy because everyone didn't think that I should leave and thought I was crazy for leaving because I never never told anybody what was going on. And then for everybody to kind of turn their back on me, and then once they hear about what's actually happened, they're like, whoa, well, my gosh, why did you stay so long? You know, so kind of judged for, you know, leaving and then judge for staying so long. So I've kind of felt like I can't really, you know, I've had to learn that nobody's opinion really matters. And, you know, because that's hurtful to, you know, to, you know, people that should have, should have been there for me, like they weren't and just feeling so abandoned and, like, my gosh, like, let me, you know, rebuild my life. So and do, do you feel abandoned by your family? I did. Mm-hmm. So I we, did. They, were, were, uh, when you, growing up with them, were, were, did you have a parent that was a narcissist? Did you live in a codependent household of any sort? After discovering that my ex-husband you know, learning all about that and discovering that he is one, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure my mom is one Mm -hmm. kind of, kind of rehashing just all of these stories and memories. And so, so yeah, I'm like, wow, like, did I kind of seek out somebody that was similar to like what I'm comfortable with and what I know, like in a, in a family relationship, like that's kind of, that's what we do. Self-sabotaging. That's what we do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's the pattern, you know, and you yeah. know what, you know, when you looked up, uh, and you said, uh, my, that my husband is this textbook or my ex-husband is this textbook thing. I see everything that's gone. Yeah. We ourselves, the ones that usually, it's not all the time, but usually, um, we're acting out a textbook pattern ourselves and it's something that's hard yeah. to stop. Uh, until you're aware that you're doing it. So, you know, what, what, right. you know, being a people pleaser and, 
you know, being trained to say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and have no opinion. Yeah, so and, is there a codependence, uh, a codependent anonymous uh, group in the city that you're in? I don't, I don't know. I uh, support it. Yeah, there's probably a code, if you're in a major city, there's probably a codependent anonymous group in your city. Okay. And uh, there, there might be people uh, that's free to go to. And there's, there, there's people to work on that aspect of things. And, uh, I mean, you, you, you know, they won't be dealing with any trauma stuff, which, I mean, you still uh, have to deal with. But as far as patterns and understanding your codependency issues, because a lot, a lot of times um, the number one, you know, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, I am no doctor, everyone, uh, as a warning, this is just my opinion, uh, awareness of what you're doing and just being aware of your patterns. Um, G.I. Joe said, no, like, knowing is half the battle. And awareness and being aware of what you do and all the little things that you do, that's half the battle of stopping yourself. The other battle is actually stopping <laughs> yourself from doing these, like right. falling into these things and saying yes all the time and being agreeable and letting things slide. But the awareness mm-hmm. part is if you're before, you know, if you were, you were unaware of everything, then I mean, it's impossible to be blamed for anything that you're doing because it's just your natural actions and reactions to life. Right. And what you've been taught. Yeah. That those are the skills you were given. I mean, there's no blame that can be put on you for any of that. And it's a, mm-hmm. really until you learn or people learn, in my opinion, that once you're aware of all of the things that you're doing and you're aware that you're doing these things, then at those times you can have a little bit of blame put on you in those situations, but it takes a lot to get to that awareness stage and always being aware because most people just act and react to things and they don't think about what they're doing. And uh, it's part Mm -hmm. of growing as like as a person to sit back and and say, I did this. I don't want to do this anymore. I see myself doing this and I can't stop it, but now I want to work on stopping it. And it's part of the healing process uh, as well. And it's just, you know, people, you know, the only way to learn is to make a mistake. And, uh, that's, we're all human. We all make mistakes. And sometimes we know that we did them and sometimes we don't even, uh, realize. And, um, you know, we're just, we're all in this, in it together. And, uh, as long as you keep on, you know, trying and, you dust yourself off. You're going to take steps backwards and take steps forwards after. And you might take two steps forward, five steps backward, but you keep on, mm-hmm. keep on going. And, um, you know, as far as uh, maybe starting off if, with, if there's a free, one free resource you have in your town, um, and if it's Codependency Anonymous, which I'm a, a fan of uh, sending people there, you know, it's, it's a 12-step program. Uh, it's a God-based program or a higher power program. So your church might know something about it. Um, Mm -hmm. But it might be useful uh, for you uh, to at least uh, a place to start because there's a lot of people there. um, And since it's anonymous, it's a group that you can trust. And it sounds like you need people you can trust. Yeah. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, I went off on a tangent there. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, oh, you're fine. No, you're fine. So, um, what else is going on? What else is happening from this? Like, how, how are you feeling right you know, now? Because this, is, you, this is, seems like the first time you verbalized um, everything. And uh, so, I just, I just want to make sure uh, what's going on on, on on the other side of the microphone uh, and just yeah. how, you, how you're feeling. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm doing okay. I, I'm shocked at, like, how this journey's played out, and I'm shocked, you know, just everything that's happened and just kind of just trying to keep hope, like, 
you know, with every new thing and, you know, it's like, I haven't given up, you know, you know, I remember my, my oldest daughter telling me, mom, like if I were you, like I, I would have given up a long time ago. And, you know, that statement from her was really profound because, I thought, you know, at least somebody sees, uh, like, I'm persistent. And then my brother-in-law texted me, like, last Sunday. And he said, you know, I see your face. And, you know, like, you don't quit. And, you know, just having to work extra hard to pull through this. And I'm almost like, like, this has got to be the worst of it. Like, like, it has to be better from here. Like, it has to be. You know, I mean, I know anything can happen, but, you know, almost everything has happened and it's like this is like things have got to get better so you know you don't give up hope and you know I am feeling more hope but yeah like wanting to have more awareness of you know my actions also because obviously like I don't I haven't done a good job picking spouses (laughs) and so you know there's you know the thought of getting married again terrifies me almost to the point where I've told people I like I don't want to get married again like I just don't think that's in the cards for me so that's kind of where I stand with that but you know and you know the loneliness factor you know there's still there's still not not many friends around you know because they all ran off through all this trauma so you know, maybe in the steps of finding myself and healing, like I'll meet new people. Like, I, like, I don't know. Like, that's my hope. You will. It's, uh, but it just takes, just, it, it takes time and you have to be easy on yourself. Uh, I know that might, you might not, uh, are you hard on yourself now? Um, do you beat yourself up a lot? Yeah. Yeah. So you have, you know, over time, um, you know, you'll learn to, you have to be gentle with yourself because in a certain way you're, you're now a beginner of learning uh, new things in, in, in life. This is, you know, you're coming back to a square one and healing and trying to, I mean, you've uh, trying to break these patterns and these cycles and these things will be brand new and you might not always succeed the first times and you might find yourself back in possibly the same situation or, but you'll be have hopefully tools at that point to be aware of what's going on and get yourself out of situations quicker. Um, right. and, 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 and when those things do happen, the most important thing is to, um, be gentle with yourself and my, like one of the, a lot of people will, will, te- will try and tell you or, te- or say something along the lines of if you're beating yourself up and saying negative things to yourself, um, what would you say to your daughter or what would you say to your child uh, if, if they were uh, beating themselves up? And you would probably be nice to them and say nice yeah. things to them. And you probably, um, I'm just going to assume that you don't do that for yourself and you have to remind yourself, you know, that the kid that's inside you needs, you know, uh, needs to hear those words too and to say those kind words to yourself because you deserve those kind words. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. (laughs) You know, everyone deserves, uh, to treat themselves in the best way possible. And a lot of us, including myself, uh, don't always uh, do that. And uh, it's the inner critic in your head that is Mm -hmm. uh, eating away at you. And it takes a lot of work. Uh, I've been trying, I've been working at it for a long time. And trust me, it's still, it'll still come back and creep up on me, especially when you don't want to. And it throws you, it throws you off. And, uh, but eventually you kind of find your footing and, uh, work from there, but it takes, it takes a lot of work. And when you're ready to do it, cause you know, you still have a lot of 
other like stuff to do, but when you're ready to do it, you know, you you do it and you work hard at it and slowly but surely baby steps you you, you start getting there, but um mm-hmm. it's baby steps. And and that's important, baby steps. You got to walk <laughs> you got to you got to walk or crawl, crawl before you walk and then walk before you run. Yeah. So my worry right now is that I'm uh, that I that I have you in a, in a in a bad place on the other side of of this conversation, and I don't want to get off the <laughs> off the phone with you, because um, <laughs> um, you know I I want you to uh, not be in a uh, no one always has to be in a great mood, but I just want like a, a good sense of uh, kind of how you're feeling and. Uh, even when I finish this call, I'm going I'm to stay on, on the phone with you for a little bit. Um, so do you want do you want to end uh, the call right here, and then we'll talk offline? Sure. Okay. So uh, everyone who is uh, listening, thank you for uh, listening today, and thank you, uh, Jana, for being part of our show and sharing your story. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, everyone, uh, after this, so you'll probably hear me uh, give one final goodbye in a uh, take that I'm not doing on this phone, uh, on this call. So that kind of makes sense in my head and not to you. Anyway, I'm going to shut up right now. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening. See you later. So that was my interview with Jana. And as you can tell, uh, there was... A lot of concern on my end of what was going on on the other side of the phone. I didn't know what type of state uh, she was in, so I thought it was best to uh, stop the recording uh, to be as responsible as possible. So it just, I, I didn't feel, I didn't want to, I, sometimes I feel like I exploit people by doing kind of this in the podcast in that way, but I didn't, uh, I felt it was, it was, it was in the best interest to just uh, shut the podcast down and, and speak to her uh, just on the phone without any recording. And uh, we had a, a couple of laughs and got back into uh, a little bit of a uh, regular state of conversation, not an interview conversation. And it went back and forth. And uh, we looked online for uh, different or, uh, different uh, meetup groups or support groups, YWCA type stuff uh, in her area and uh, le- left off in, in, in a good place uh, for her to move forward. And again, if anyone is in uh, the Oklahoma, I guess Oklahoma City area and knows of uh, free resources uh, for Jana and her family, that would be helpful if you could email me uh, Chad the Impaler, sorry, Chad, yeah, Chad the Impaler 99 at gmail.com. That would be great. So I can get all that information to Jana if you're uh, in Oklahoma City and listening. And uh, besides that, uh, hopefully you like our show and have been uh, interested in the survivor stories and the letters to the narcissist uh, stories that we did the other day. And if you want to also be a guest on our show, uh, email me at that exact same address. Uh, you can get a hold of me there, and you can go to the website NarcissistApocalypse.com. There's a contact form there that you can use as well. Uh, also, subscribe to our podcast uh, on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Google Play, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, all, every service. I think we're on every service now. Uh, give us some reviews and uh, nice five-star ones. And hopefully uh, send us, I I like getting emails from people uh, about updates on their life or uh, what they think of the show. So uh, it's nice when I get those. So send those to me. And besides that, uh, I think that is all I have to cover today. So thank you for listening to uh, to the How to Survive the Narcissist Apocalypse podcast. I am Chad the Impaler, and thanks for listening. This is an emergency broadcast transmission. This is not a test. This is an emergency broadcast transmission. This is not a test. Please remain calm.